Hey, I'm Ethan Zuckerman. Welcome back to Reimagining the Internet. Um, our interview today is part of our series, our informal, multi-part, who knows how long it's going to last, series called How They Imagined the Internet. It's a series on internet history. Uh, and in that context, I am thrilled to have with us uh, Professor Kevin Driscoll. Kevin Driscoll is assistant professor in the Department of Media Studies at the University of Virginia. He's the co-author of a wonderful book, Minitel, Welcome to the Internet, with Julian Milland. And together, they co-founded the Minitel Research Lab, uh, which is a wonderful digital Minitel museum and resource center. And if you go to the University of Indiana, you can actually visit uh, a collection of Minitels in person. Um, he's the author of a forthcoming book that I have recently been reading called The Modem World, A Prehistory of Social Media. And he is someone who has really spent his academic career fascinated uh, by what we might call Jurassic Internet tech. Kevin, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me on. So, uh, and, and I'm noticing over your shoulder, uh, some of said Jurassic Internet tech. I, I am a fan of this era of computing as well. For me, it is a bit of a nostalgia trip. I have a, a Commodore pet in the other room that I learned to program on in the early 1980s. What got you fascinated with sort of what we might think of as internet prehistory? Um, mm -hmm. Minitel, which obviously you, you didn't grow up with, uh, but also the, the BBS culture of the 1980s. What made this a research interest for you? Well, I started off having a bit of a personal interest just in the joy of learning about myths and folklore to do with uh, early internet. And I kind of assumed all these things were already written down. And then when I went to find them on the shelves of the library, they weren't there. Uh, as time has gone on and, and I've been more and more interested in how we address the large and, and looming problems of our current era, I realize, like, in a lot of ways, the stories we tell about the past are lacking in the power to explain or provide light on uh, where we might go into the future. So I've thought of this research as developing narrative resources, like story fragments that other people can make use of to imagine new futures for the internet, and ideally futures that are more just, that are addressing some of the problems of bias and access and equity that we've documented so well in other areas of scholarship. So I really want to get into depth on BBSs and sort of the birth of internet community because I think the new book is so important at this moment where we are reconsidering uh, the present and the future of the social web. But before we get there, I want to talk about <laughs> that dominant narrative. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So. I got on the internet for the first time in 1989, and I think one of the first things I read was one of these internet FAQs about the early history of the internet, which drags it back to 1969 and coming out of DARPA and sort of traces it through the development of these military and academic networks. Um, and it feels like a very well-developed um, history. And I sort of felt in 1989 like I was putting myself in the context of it, you know, honestly, 20 years in, right, since we, we sort of start with 69 as a beginning date. What, what's missing from that history? And, and how did that particular history of TCP IP, this one networking protocol, this one particular internet, rather than all those other internets out there. How mm -hmm. does this become the dominant narrative that any self-respecting geek knows today, but which you go to some length in, in both of these books to explain is not the only narrative and, and actually a, a quite incomplete narrative? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that anecdote about the FAQ because that's where I went in my research also was trying to trace the root of that story. How did that become the story that we tell? Um, there's a few different pieces of it which are, are kind of interesting to break apart. The first is that the very word internet meant different things to different people mm. at different points in time. So for a very particular and I would say narrow definition of internet, that was a really like accurate history that traced the emergence of particular research community that was unusually open, generative, collaborative. I mean, it's a really special moment for a lot of people in their careers. I mean, this early internet and ARPANET community had 
major contributions from students. It had major contributions from people who we would see as staff, which is sometimes a lower status role in university environments. And so from that point of view, this is really special and different from other research projects that are going on. And so we want to celebrate that. Mm. By the end of the 1990s, of course, we have a different meaning of the term internet. It's come to mean something closer to what people were talking about as information superhighway or even interactive television, global information infrastructure. There is like a a, a number of words being circulated by different actors with different stakes. But we rewrote the definition of internet, but didn't change the history. So we have the history for an earlier meaning of internet that just carries on forward. I was thinking a lot about that FAQ thing because those FAQs end up being the kind of rough drafts of books like this. I brought some uh, show and tell. So Internet for Dummies, um, The Big Dummies Guide to the Internet. There's a number of related uh, books that get made. Almost all of them have a couple pages of history at the beginning and tell a variation of the like ARPANET to internet story. They're all a reworking of that same FAQ, which has been circulating around. Eric, Eric Scott Raymond was a, an editor for it at one point. I mean, we've all seen a few different versions of it. Um, to the best of my knowledge, it doesn't mention Minitel. To the best of my knowledge, it doesn't mention um, BBSs. It doesn't mention all of these corporate networks mm -hmm. that turn out to be incredibly important um, in the early foundation of things like CompuServe, which turns out to be... Um, a, a computer time sharing network independent of the internet, which, you know, obviously must have existed, but as an internet history geek, I, I knew absolutely nothing about. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's interesting to put yourselves in the shoes of someone like Vince Cerf, who's an advocate for the internet, both in the academy and at the side of telecoms, like working for MCI. And he is advocating using these open protocols like TCP IP to build interconnection and gateway between networks. So if you're in that position of advocacy, CompuServe is not the internet. Like by definition, it's not using the internet protocols. However, if we're standing in 2022 and looking back and we're saying, what looks like the internet we inhabit today? Well, and the things that are happening on CompuServe are critically important to the history of the practices that we undertake today. Like forums where you debate politics or meet other fans of TV shows and things that you like, trading files, getting pictures, getting news reports of breaking news from around the world. Those are things happening on commercial services. They're also happening on the academic networks too. But the reason they wouldn't have been considered part of internet history is because they weren't part of that uh, version of the internet that's defined by its technical infrastructure. But that's not the def definition of internet that any of my students are using. It's not the definition of the internet that most policymakers are using. So uh, essentially, this document that I very much grew up on, it sounds like you are also fascinated with, um, it, is almost a protocol history, or it it's a social history of the internet but defining the internet around the narrow protocol of TCP IP, which I would hasten to remind our listeners is the, the sort of basic backbone protocol of the internet that we know and love today. But mm -hmm. an actual rich social history of the internet includes many, many other threads. And, and the one mm -hmm. that I want to bring in at this point is Minitel. Mm -hmm. First of all, what was Minitel and how did you learn about and start getting fascinated with Minitel? Yeah, so Minitel is a public data network that was started in France and became accessible to people in the general public by the early 1980s. And it was in some ways supposed to be a major evolution of their telephone infrastructure. But it was done so under a vision of combined telematics that would include television, uh, broadcasting, and two-way communications like telephones with data communications around computer infrastructure. So it's a really interesting design for a platform. It looks really different than what was happening elsewhere in Unix-based networks like that were using TCP IP and also other related protocols. But it had this key piece, which was to put the Minitel terminals, that is like the machines that you use to access the network in the homes and schools and offices of everyday people. And that component of it, that public access and public interest aspect of the Minitel project wasn't really a part of any of the 
major networks that we've been talking about so far. How I got interested in it is is a kind of funny biographical story, which is my colleague, Julian Malin, we were in grad school together and we both were working on what we might think of as more present day issues. Like Julian was working a lot on uh, speech censorship, also net neutrality. And, but we had this interest in Minitel and, and Julian having grown up in France had firsthand experience with the Minitel terminals. And we started playing with Minitel for the joy of experimenting with it. And in at the time, Minitel still was an operating network. It continued to be in service until 2012. So for that purpose, we make the claim that, you know, this is one of our longest running public uh, communication infrastructures. And from that point of view, it's really striking just to think of its longevity. It almost invites us to be historical because of the long temporal scope for this project. Um, but at the time, Minitel was kind of like e-waste in France. And so anytime that Julian would visit his family, he would bring back some Minitel hardware in his carry-on luggage. And we started to build a collection and document our experiments uh, at the Minitel Research Lab website, which was intentionally tongue-in-cheek. The full name is Minitel Research Lab USA, and the URL is minitel.us, because it was so odd that we would be looking at it from the, the living in Southern California at the time. But then as we work, were working on it, it, we realized how frequently the experiences of people on Minitel spoke directly to some of the problems that we were working on. And we started to see Minitel as a real working case study that provided an alternative example to the web and to other social media systems. We didn't have to invent it or come up with hypotheticals or draw uh, some kind of you know, fictional case study. We had a system that was really used by millions of people day in and day out for years. And we should be, we should be able to have those kinds of case studies richly laid out so that we can use them for comparison and contrast with some of the systems we rely on today. I, I love this notion of um, Minitel as sort of a long durée, you know, technical history mm -hmm. that that having three full decades there. Um, and thinking back to 82, I mean, 82 is amazingly early mm -hmm. in um, particularly tech in the home. And mm -hmm. I, please correct me if I'm wrong here. I, I, Minitel was um, not necessarily very costly to use, although it did have a cost per minute. But I think the hardware was provided gratis, um, almost as if you would give people a telephone directory. Is that correct? Yeah, they thought thought about this as like a chicken and the egg problem, that the platform, as we characterize it, is a public infrastructure for private innovation. So this most of the services on Minitel are provided by private people or organizations. And then most of the users are also private. And then it's the network in the middle that's managed by the state. And so to have anybody make a service, there has to be users. And to get any users, you need some services. So they found a way to both provide local manufacturers with a huge contract and to provide people with access to low cost access to, to this um, system by making a very affordable to produce um, standard terminal that was a screen, a keyboard and a modem that fit into a very nice box and was made to look good and look appropriate in your home in the early 1980s. So it has like this brown molded plastic. It has a handle on top that you can carry. You, they kind of imagine you're going to stick it in a cupboard when you're not using it. And you could get it for free. It took a few years to roll out. So between, say, 82 and 86, it gradually becomes available nationwide. And you would pick it up at the post office. This is a you know state agency providing access. It was costly to use per minute, and that limited the number of people who could really get deeply into all of the nooks and crannies of Minitel, but some services were not. And so the electronic telephone book is a really important piece of Minitel history where you could connect to the electronic telephone book for free for a certain number of minutes. So virtually everybody in the country who was alive at the time from children to the elderly had some experience of Minitel by looking up names and addresses of businesses there. And actually, enthusiasts have recreated aspects of the electronic telephone book that you can see on the web at 3611.re. It's a really faithful recreation, but with present day data. Oh, wow. It. OK, OK. Yeah. So, so, so um, you can you can go back and, and have the uh, the appropriate time honored experience of the phone directory, um, but done with uh, essentially a Minitel simulator. 
Yeah, and they they made no assumptions that people would know how to use computers. There was a, even debate about how to lay out the letters of the keyboard. So rather than AZRT, which is like the standard layout for French computers, maybe they should be A, B, C, D, just like alphabetical. Because if the people don't know how to type at all, maybe it's just as well that they would learn in some other form. For everybody's benefit, it turned out that to use the they used AZRT, which is like the standard keyboard layout mm -hmm. on typewriters as well. Um, but you can see how like everything was on the table. This is such a brand new system that there were no standards in place and you weren't rushing, like, running against people's expectations on what it meant to go online because they had none. A big part of the Minitel story is what happens when people go online for the very first time. And so we're also interested in how Minitel is represented and reflected in popular culture. Like police procedurals would have a storyline yep. where the murderer is on the Minitel service. There, we have all these pop songs on our website that are about love stories or affairs that take place over Minitel. So it really like suffuses in culture, even if you're not using it, if you're because you can't afford or you can't justify the cost of getting on there, you're still like enveloped in a world that is in part shaped by the presence of Minitel. We, we also see on Minitel very early on um, the idea that any sufficiently developed internet technology will be used for adult content. Can you talk briefly yeah. about pink Minitel? Yeah, so the Minitel rose or the, the pink Minitel is like a category, unofficial category of Minitel services, which are adult content, you could say. Um, while there are there is some evidence of like animated pornography, most of this adult content is not porn in the sense of Pornhub. This is people chatting with other people. And so some of the popular media coverage of it talks about it as like the return of the masquerade ball. Mm. You go and you can put on this other identity and you can chat with other people. You may or may not meet them offline. A lot of the stories that would appear in American popular media in the 1990s about like, these two people were chatting and then can you believe they got married and now they have a baby? Like those stories are prevalent in the, the 1980s Minitel case as well. So uh, the probably the most memorable part of Minitel Rose is not the use of it, but the advertising of it, which was all over the streets of Paris mm. and on television. And um, if you look in the media archives, at, uh, the National Media Archives of France, you find dozens of television ads for Minitel services, which from just seeing the ad, it's hard to know even what happens on those services because it'll just be like a woman whispering the short code that you type in to get onto the service. Um, but some of those were some of the longest lasting service, uh, services. So like Tonsis Kintz Ula, which is one of the most well-known pink services, stayed online right up until the 2012, the conclusion of the, the platform. So it it is just remarkable that there's this entire chapter of history, which those of us who didn't grow up in France tend not to know about. Mm -hmm. Your more recent book, the, the book that's um, coming out, I believe, in March, um, uh, The Modem World, is a, a world that's actually much closer. It's, it's the world very much that I grew up in, but was way too dark and dangerous for my parents to let me participate in. Uh, I was a, I was an America Online kid. Um, but the world that all of these closed services like CompuServe and AOL came out of was a much more open world of bulletin board systems. What was a bulletin board system and why should we care? <laughs> That's a really interesting way to frame it. Um, I'll say the what first and then why you should care. Yeah. So the what is like a bulletin board system is it's basically a piece of software running on a computer that's connected to a telephone. And in the in the vast majority of cases, the computer can answer the phone. And so it sits there and it you're providing access to the, the computer to anybody who dials in a, into your home telephone. By and large, these started as mimicking the community bulletin board, like the cork and pins bulletin board you would see on a college campus or uh, in the entryway to a grocery store or a church or something like that. You can post an announcement and you can read the announcements that other people have posted. So for the contemporary analogy is like a forum mm -hmm. or a message board. Um, by the late 1980s, they had expanded to include most of the kinds of services that we associate with the uh, early internet. So live chat rooms, MUDs and other online games, file downloading, and then a range of other kinds of online services like um, dating profiles or um, 
other kinds of interactive things like astrology and stuff like that. So bulletin board systems are a, in some ways a forerunner of some of the commercial services that you're describing, but they also run in parallel with it. And it's a global phenomenon. And so whereas my book focuses principally on North America for a reason that I'll explain in a second, this is a global phenomenon. And I'm in conversation with researchers uh, in many other parts of the world where BBSs take on a different life in part because they are so independent. They're uh, something that you attach to the existing telephone network and they run over standard telephone lines. And so for that reason, they have to use different protocols than the uh, networks that have state support like ARPANET and others. But it also means that they are not subject to surveillance and censorship at, in the same ways that a state-sponsored network might be. One reason that I focus on North America is because of my experience talking about the Minitel work, which is lots of folks who are familiar with the dominant mythology of, of the internet would say like, oh, it's so great to read Minitel because now we have this French story and that like complements the story from North America. And I was like, but we also don't really have the full story of what all was happening on this side of the world at the same time. Um, in, in many ways, because that standard ARPANET to web story leaps over at least 10 years of activity, where a lot of the action is on bulletin boards and related commercial services. Yeah, so so let's let's start by kind of reminding people what computing looks like in the 1980s, because that, that's really where this book focuses. Um, mm -hmm. The home computer, to the extent that people have it, um, doesn't really come with very much software. It has a very basic operating system. Most of these machines have um, an interpreter, often for basic. Um, mm -hmm. There's a decent chance that if you have one of these machines, you may be trying to teach yourself basic or some other programming language. You may be entering in software that is printed in a magazine. And so mm -hmm. you go down to the bookstore, buy the magazine and enter in as carefully as you can um, these programs. It's very, very difficult to move data from machines. The dominant um, mechanism for moving data from machine to machine is via cassette tape where mm -hmm. you're literally recording e or e or as ones and zeros that can be played back to load a program if you're very very lucky mm -hmm. how how do bulletin boards sort of bridge the gap at this point where your computer is is this very lonely very isolated machine uh, alone by itself uh on on your desktop yeah let me add a couple of details also to that, yeah. that really rich historical portrait. One is that the machines really don't come with any hardware for networking, mm -hmm. which is something that's like so outside of the norm for us over the last 10 or 20 years. The notion that you would buy a laptop without Wi-Fi is like preposterous because what else, what use is it if it can't connect to other computers? But of course, modems are not standard issue and neither are networking cards. Um, and so to the yeah, in terms of your priorities of what to buy, you'd probably buy like a printer and a joystick and another disk drive before you threw out the $200 to get a modem. So even among the minority of people who own home computers, those who also own a modem is like yet another subset. And there is cultural reasons why you would be a modem owner. And so it becomes a kind of mark of distinction to even own a modem to know why it's useful to have one in the first place. There's nothing like the media phenomena around Minitel where you're seeing the online world reflected back to you on television for bulletin boards. It's very much like a subcultural activity and the buying a modem is your ticket to entry. You really need another person to show you them going online on their modem to know why you would buy one in the first place. So most bulletin boards are created it following on some offline relationships that already exist. So sometimes it's like a computer club or an after school program at a K-12 school or a local newspaper, magazine, fanzine, some kind of like print publication who builds like an online addition to the thing that they're doing. Um, ham radio clubs are another big source of interest in, in early bulletin boards. So often what happens is people are meeting in person and have friendships and they start talking about how to extend 
something like a monthly meeting into an ongoing activity or to put, they have a bunch of resources like articles that have been published in their fanzine and they want to put them somewhere. So they put them on the bulletin board. Or, it they, have, that. or they have massive amounts of pirated software and they want to share it with other people. Who, <laughs> I, I want to make sure that we're actually being very clear about oh, we're why there. a lot yeah. of people were, were spending time on bulletin boards in the 1980s and why my parents wouldn't let me have a modem. Yes. But what happens in the early 90s is a lot of the people who are building bulletin boards are starting to figure out ways to make interconnection to the internet. And with the redefinition of internet, when your bulletin board becomes connected to the internet, the internet doesn't become bulletin board net. It, your bulletin board becomes part of the internet and mm. it vanishes into the internet in a real uh, discursive sense. Um, so what, what happens is like, I think for folks who are building the early web, they're used to having this like, connection, whether it's Winsock or whatever, that's creating a, a packet switch connection to this network. And then they have a bunch of stuff that they run off it. They have like their email client, IRC, whatever. And the web is one more tool that sits on top of their TCP IP connection. It's not till later that the web is your like primary mode of accessing all of those other internet services. So initially the web serves the purpose of having homepages and hypertext and things like that. And bulletin board system operators, you know, they're used to bulletin boards serving multiple functions, but they're also used to this experience of like, it's always changing and you never know what you're going to get when you log in. There's all these ways that bulletin board system software reminds you of the existence of other people. Even if the bulletin board is a single line system that can only accommodate one user at a time, it's telling you, here's how many people logged in today. Here's the average time they were on. This person uploaded this file. This person posted nine messages, blah, blah, blah. So you, you feel like you're in this lively system, whereas websites didn't really do that particularly in the beginning. And it's, I kind of argue through the book that it's the joining of the web and bulletin board systems that transforms the web into a social medium. It's the expectations of those long-term BBS users that hey, computers are here so we can talk to each other, trade files, get advice, argue about politics, whatever. So if you give us a new medium, we're going to adapt it to do that. Um, so so yeah. one, one very strong support for your argument is that in addition to the sort of official accepted history of the internet, which we've established as a very incomplete and selective history, there's almost a sort of official here is why the web is important. Here is why we should pay attention to the web. And a lot of that runs through Howard Rheingold. A lot of that runs through the well, which mm -hmm. is this disproportionately influential bulletin board system. It, it, it's, it, it, help me sort of understand the well in all of this context. The well is this Bay Area based network that appears to be mostly occupied by tech journalists who go on to write books about the internet. Um, how, how does it have things in common and how is it, how is it different from the rest of this scene that you're documenting? Yeah, the well is such a like fun case to work with in this context because it's such an outlier. But it's an outlier in its political economy. It's an outlier in the population of users that are there. It's outlier in terms of how much visibility it has in mainstream media and how much documentation we have of it. Um, but it's the it's possibly the best documented bulletin mm. board. It sits in this like kind of gray area where it's often included in lists of nationwide online systems. So like the Boston Globe might run an article about going online in the 80s and they'll be like, here's how to get online. You have CompuServe, Quantum Link, Genie, The Source, and The Well. And they'll throw The Well in as the at the bottom, even though it has an order of magnitude fewer users. So on one hand, it gets advertised as like a nationwide system, but it's still super local. Like it mm. is a Bay, you know, when you're connecting to the well, you're kind of in your mind connecting to the Bay Area. Yeah. And it has this like Bay Area reputation. It's tied to the longer, you know, counterculture to cyber culture story that uh, Fred Turner's documented mm -hmm. so well. Um, but at the same time, the well we don't even tell the well story that well <laughs> because the well is also a huge um, stomping grounds for Grateful Dead fandom. And so it's a meeting place for deadheads. It's a place that you can go and do tape trading and meet, find people to share rides to shows or trade tickets. It's a place where a lot of today's deadhead resources like databases of show listings and track listings and, and knowledge about what tapes exist were first being compiled on the well. Mm. And all those people are paying the monthly fee and the per, per hour fee to be online, 
whereas many of the Bay Area intelligentsia had gratis accounts or discounted uh, monthly accounts. So in some ways, I'm thinking like this is a fandom history about music fans that are enabling this other kind of like intellectual community to flourish. And they work together the way that many social media systems we use today also have these like multiple disparate, somewhat overlapping groups. And it's the interactions between them that sustain the whole system. The piece of the bulletin board system story that I come back to time and again is the role of the sysop. Like this, that's the mm. system operator. It's a really, really important figure in BBS history that's almost absent of all dominant platforms like Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. Those platforms, despite their uh, how huge they are, they imagine that there will be automated systems that handle the care work all the way down to the edges of the groups and the small communities and things that gather in those spaces, which is such an abdication of responsibility and in some ways is, is so disrespectful to the work of community management that has been done over the years. And we, it's so frustrating because we've seen platforms make these mistakes in the past. There were lawsuits about the volunteer labor that happened on America Online, where America Online originally promised that moderators of the groups would be paid in time, free time on the system. And then when they changed their business model, that was no longer a fair trade, and yet they still expected the volunteer moderators to be there night after night. Um, Minitel, there were similarly volunteer moderators, and there's um, some great work that Jeff, Jeff Nagy has done, and I can give you some of these links along the way to look at the that kind of labor that it comes up time and again. Bulletin board systems are unique in that the labor of the sysop is recognized by all of the people who are involved, and the sysop is very intensely accountable to many of the people. So most bulletin board systems are not like the well. They don't have 9,000 users all over the country. They have 10 or 20 or 100 people who mostly live pretty close to them, and they probably meet them in person. So a lot of bulletin board systems, to get on them, you had to be verified by a voice telephone call or even a face-to-face -face meeting. And so these sysops, and I mentioned many of them in the book, they are directly accountable to not only maintaining the system, like keeping it running, keeping the lights on, making sure it's connected to the telephone, but also upholding norms and values and articulating what those norms and values are and ought to be. Kevin, I, I, I want to ask maybe sort of one one parting thought on all of this. You, you have this wonderful lesson in the Minitel book Um that essentially infrastructures matter and, and publicly funded infrastructures matter and they can be profoundly generative. You have an amazing lesson in the bulletin boards book, which is, I think really that there are alternate histories and that sometimes we have to recognize these histories to understand that things like social computing have, have very deep roots behind them. 30 years from now, someone's going to write a book about this moment in computing. Any senses about what people are going to want to celebrate, want to understand about this particular moment? When when people come back and um, a young scholar in 2052 is looking at what I'm sure at that point will be the, the early or the Jurassic net, what do you think they're going to catch on to? What, what do you think will be worth um, going back to and considering um, 30 years in the future? Yeah, that's a great question. I have, I have two part answer for that. So one would be, we kind of know what the dominant story is going to be. It's playing out in the op-ed pages of big newspapers. And it's like, this is the period of time of like doom and gloom. Things are horrible, but we actually have no clue the diversity of practices and communities that are emerging in these different spaces. And we still don't recognize the longevity of so many systems and communities that have either persisted, like the well, which is still a thriving online community, uh, or have migrated from one place to the next. Like uh, I have a family member who is in a motorcycle club that moved from like an email list to a Yahoo group, to a forum, to a Facebook group. There is persistence there. And then I think in the longer history, we'll look back at the, the say like late 19th century to the early 21st century as a period of like constructing something like the grid or the net or the matrix that is this like integrated information infrastructure. And we'll stop thinking about it as like, there was the telegraph and then the telephone and then TV and then cable TV and then satellite TV. Like those nuances will be interesting to some historians, but we will see it as a period of like network making. 
And so when we look at these particular systems or these events that seem to punch through the, the narrative or some of the hype cycle, like the 2016 election or things like that, then we'll think of them in the, in the broader context of that building of global interconnectivity. And then we ask about like, well, who had accountability, who had responsibility or stewardship over these moments, who demonstrated care, who demonstrated an investment and recognition of the needs of community. And, you know, we'll look to policymakers and we'll look to business owners and things like that. But I imagine that there will be stories that have yet to be written that are playing out now and they are marginalized or they're they're disconnected from the ways that stories like surface to the top of Twitter trending topics and things like that. Kevin, this is such a pleasure. I, I just want to commend both of these books um, to, to anyone who has uh, enjoyed this conversation. The first one is Minitel, Welcome to the Internet, uh, which you wrote along with Jillian Milland. Uh, and the new one um, out in just a couple of weeks is The Modem World, A Prehistory of Social Media. Thank you so much for being with us. Thanks so much for your time. It's really a blast. Mm-hmm.